Jamie Shannon is a puppeteer, writer, director, and the co-creator of the television shows Nanaland and Mr. Meaty. You've seen his work on Nickelodeon, Playhouse Disney, and on bus benches, too. I talked to Jamie about his puppetry career and his thoughts on creating puppet shows for television on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Under the Puppet is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons. To support the show and hear new episodes before anyone else, become a patron. Visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media for more information. And thank you for your support. Welcome to the show that talks to puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Welcome to Under the Puppet. This episode, my guest is puppeteer, writer, director, and creator Jamie Shannon. Jamie started creating puppet-based shows for television at a very early age, and he has not slowed down since. His credits include creating the shows Nanalan and Mr. Meaty, and directing and puppeteering on the show Big and Small. Jamie is an inspiring puppeteer, and I know you're going to get a lot out of our talk. Here now is my interview with Jamie Shannon. Jamie Shannon, welcome to Under the Puppet. Hey, thanks. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. I got a lot of questions for you, and I'm hoping uh, we can get answers to all of them. But uh, I always like to start with, do you remember your first exposure to puppetry? Like watching? Sure, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, I was a... I mean, does polka dot door count? (laughs) They were kind of like stuffed animals that they were like, what's that Humpty? What's that Dumpty? Was that like a show that you watched? Yeah, it was like a Canadian kid show. Yeah. And then there was like Mr dress up and he had little paper mache guys he was sort of like our mr rogers Mm -hmm. and then i mean i'm i'm from the uh the i don't know the renaissance of yoda and muppet show and all that stuff in the sort of late 70s yeah so all that stuff kind of influenced you yeah and you mentioned these kids programs i wanted to ask because you've done a lot of programming for children over the years yeah um were those the shows that kind of inspired you to get into it uh, it was more creatures, actually. I mm-hmm. think my, my original love was, like, Gremlins, Yoda, and Dino... Like, I was a dinosaur kid, yeah. like a lot of little boys, which turned into a creature lover. So I just lived for, I don't know, the story... What's the story? Never-ending story. Never-ending story. Anything yeah. with a creature in it blew my mind. Right. So I kind of started that way. And then the cute kind of... That's just the funnel of puppets. Right, right. Did you, um, were you a builder as a kid, like trying to build these creatures that you were seeing? Um, I have some funny little, yeah, I was def- I made stop motion books and I definitely made some crazy costumes. I made lots of really good costumes and then I made a, I made a marionette at camp, a, a bird out of sticks. I did a Little Shop of Horrors play at camp. Mm-hmm. I was the, when I was a, like a CIT counselor in training, I was the drama the drama guy so i made out of mattresses a bunch of you know a bunch of plants that was pretty fun yeah and you were in you so you built those you built i built those yeah 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 oh that's amazing that's great uh were your parents creative at all they were creative my dad made a great uh charcuterie plate (laughs) (laughs) like beautiful right but they were really good at costumes there's a whole bunch of pictures of them and like caveman costumes or just all those different costumes so i was pretty inspired by that did they help you out like learning how to do this stuff or were you all just completely it by was yourself? kind of my own thing yeah my nana was an influence mm-hmm. she's the nana from nanaland oh, like okay. she was the inspiration for nanaland and she was a sewer so she kind of got me into sewing i think she was pretty creative with that she made clothes and you know moo's for my dad and and then i got into sewing stuffed animals these stuffed animal kits I think that was my first thing. You get fun fur with this pattern on it, and you snip it out and hand sew it. So I made quite a few of those. I was I was clocking the homemade stuffed animals. Yeah, were you uh, modifying them all to make them make them move and puppets, or just making the creatures? Yeah, not really. Oh, I, oh this was kind of influenced too. I had this bucket of toys that was just like action figures and rubber lizards, and that was like my you know my shangri-la that that <laughs> box and i would just like go to the bathtub and i'd empty the bucket into there and uh manipulate those action figures for hours yeah i don't know who doesn't do that but <laughs> i loved it yeah i was inspired 
Now you mentioned the uh, teaching drama in uh, camp and stuff. Were you like performing in school as well when you were? In I was. Uh, I went to an art school. Mm-hmm. I went to a, so I was. I went to this. It was an amazing experience called Claude Watson. So grade seven and eight, I was half the day would be arts and the other half would be not arts. So I went there. I went there for visual arts, but uh, and I was a kid actor. Mm-hmm. I got into plays and stuff like that, and I did a. I don't know. I did an episode of T and T with Mister T. <laughs> Wow, how yeah. what was he like? He was uh, he was kind of depressed at that time. Oh, really? Actually, it was kind of it was after A Team. It was on his second series. I don't know. Yeah, he had really hit the heights. He had his own serial, right. but he was not uh, he was not feeling happy for some reason. Oh, Mr. T. I know. Um, well, you met Jason Hopley, who uh, became your partner when you were teenagers, and you started working on projects together. Was this at the school? That yeah, you grade to? six. Yeah. I went to this art school, and uh, he was the other super talented guy there. And uh, it wasn't until after high school that we put together this together, but we were with each other from, you know, grade six to the end of high school. Theater majors. Theater majors. Yeah. Were you were you working on, like, did you kind of, like, uh, create your own things while you were there? I mean, I know you created stuff later, but were you working? Um, yeah, we were both doing our own things. I remember he made this uh, great, uh, oh, what's that called? Uh, well, he made a Yoda. I remember he made a pretty good Yoda. Oh no, I mean um, E.T. and he made uh, what's uh, Ghostbusters the Slimer. Yeah, he sculpted a pretty nice Slimer. I was kind of a costume guy. I would say I was more into the costumes, and then the making of other things kind of just kind of f- found its way in there. Yeah. Well, according to Wikipedia, which is always correct. Um, you first developed your idea for the grogs while traveling in Europe. Is that correct? That is true. Uh, what did you see on that trip that inspired you? Um, well, I was going to just decide what I was going to do with my life. And, uh, there was, there was a few inspirations. There's this, this guy in Spain, he had this like pole across his shoulders with all these dancing puppets. So that guy was pretty inspiring, but it was also timing. Uh, Jim Henson passed away, like just when I was traveling Europe, t- deciding what to do. And it was so clear to me. I was like, I'm going to do that. You know, that's mm-hmm. a, such a, he did so much, he was so much a part of my life. And now there's a big space there. So I immediately, as soon as I got home from Europe, started sewing puppets together. I made a big monster called Cupcake and made a, it's kind of a troop of puppets. And I was in school for film and I was going to pay for school by doing library shows. And mm-hmm. and I, I only did one in the end. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and then is it true that you, because I also read this, that you dropped out of university to do puppetry on TV? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, I got so lucky. Like I was in York and uh, taking film, but it was kind of, it was hard. Like I went to an art school that was so inspired. So I was so, I felt a, kind of a in a different place than all these people who were getting to do, be, be creative for the first time in university. So the schooling wasn't that impressive anyway. But then I had a friend who was on YTV which is the Canadian youth channel mm-hmm. named Rob Stefaniak. He's made a couple films. He's been successful himself. And he brought me on to kind of like make his things more entertaining. His I, All these puppets that I had made. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, he'd play guitar and I'd be there with the puppets. And then, uh, yeah, later I brought Jason into the fold because he was interested in doing puppets as well. And uh, off we went from there. Well, and I think a lot of times artists are told, like, never work for free. You should never, ever work for free. Um, but it seems that you and Jason got a lot of a lot out of working at YTV. Yeah. yeah. Well, we weren't working for free that long. It oh, was good. about, yeah, it was real, literally like a, well, maybe it was a couple months. I don't know about that advice. I think oh, really? always work for free. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think get yourself in there. You know, especially in the arts, it's not like you're... Um, you're hired because people like you and it's who you who you know. Like all the executives in television all started with just, you know, PA jobs. Right. Schlepp and coffee. Schlepp and coffee. coffee. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, if you can afford it, get the experience and meet the people. Yeah. In any way you can. Cuz you guys made a lot of connections there, right? Yeah, well we well why why TV eventually hired us. They were right. like, you're very funny. Why don't we hire you to be our professional puppet guys and they gave us a, our own puppet room with our own ventilating system, <laughs> our own flocking machine. Wow. You know, the puppet gold. <laughs> right. So, uh we went on uh, and uh, and then we were co- we were everybody wanted to work with us at the station. We did commercials and specials and you know, all made so many puppets while we were at YTV and not even there that long. Before uh, we uh, met a manager who started taking us to Disney and Nickelodeon and all the teams. Yeah, I wanted to ask about this because um, 
you mentioned Nanaland before. Yeah. Uh, where did the idea for Nanaland come? Was it your Nana? Yeah, definitely. Um, we had created a sh- kid show for somebody else, and it was just sort of this little character I had been drawing, this little kind of Buddha character with two eyes and a smile. And um, it was my sort of like, oh, this is what inspiration is. I draw it, you know. So then, but my Nana was, she's very much an inspiration for my life. So she had this crazy backyard that was like a, I don't know, a, a person from the 50s, you know, they'd, with whirly gigs, you know, whirly gigs right. and lots of big weird flowers and um, Sylvester with, um, you know, propeller legs. So it was just sort of this backyard with all these hilarious things. So that's where, yeah, I guess that's where Nanaland was born. And that the spirit of that, which is just sort of, she's from this little town called Dundas, Ontario. And she's just, I always just picture her hands just kind of picking things up and looking at them with such precious appreciation. Like, she loves sparkly things. Like, oh, look at that. And she'd twist it and turn it in the light. And I don't know why I'm giving an Irish accent. But she (laughs) was, uh, you know, so that was what the inspiration of the show is, is like finding great appreciation for the simplest things. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned uh, Disney and going around and pitching. I heard you spend a lot, I read that you spent a lot of time pitching this show. Yeah. Oh, before, uh, well, not Nanalan. Not uh, Nanalan? The Grogs. Oh, the Grogs. Okay, we were, I'm sorry. We were called the Grogs at, right. at YTV. I didn't know. I was like, you know what I think it came, came from? I found out there's these characters called the Gorgs on uh, the Fraggles. Right. The Gorgs. And I was like, didn't put that together that I, <laughs> why I love the word. But yeah, Grogs. So I just called it the Grogs. And then, uh, and then, yeah, the we, after YTV, created the show called Planet Grog. And we were in development with Disney, and well, I think we were just too young. We couldn't figure out how to how to gear it to to television. Yeah, because we were very kind of free at YTV. It was just we were filling like a little commercial times in between each show, so there'd be two or three minutes where we just improvise, which is kind of the best <laughs> the best way to learn how to do puppets. Right. Yeah. Because you really kind of get these characters that are truly extensions of yourself with with nothing holding you back. Yeah. And uh, so, but the Grogs just never found a home. Yeah, the Grogs never found a home again, sadly. And there's some great characters, uh, especially Jason's character, Warren Grog. He was very inspired with that character. You have on on your YouTube channel, you have like a compilation of stuff and it's just hilarious. Hey, thanks. Uh, It's it's really great. And um, I'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can check it out. Yeah, I I want to keep on, I'm going to keep on putting stuff up. We did an hour long Christmas special that's quite charming. And there's a Warren takeover where we took over the channel for New Year's Day. And yeah, just kind of scrappy, fun, youthful, do anything you want stuff. So it was, it was pretty funny. Yeah, there's and there's a lot of great, um, you know, you can kind of tell that it's like, oh, you may not have had like the thousands of dollars of budget or whatever, but there's some like great shots, like things of Warren's flying and yeah, and smashing things. through the grate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of really great stuff, and yeah, know, it's it's a it's really inspiring to watch. I think. Oh, thanks. As a, as a puppeteer, yeah, we were we were very lucky. It was so lucky to be there and have that. You know, twenty one, twenty two, like really young right. to, to be having an, uh, this national spot yeah um well getting back to nanoland once it was picked up it was picked up as shorts right yeah yeah um there's this guy peter moss and he was at ytv i was a pj myself and he offered the pjs they could make a show a three-minute show if they wanted to so i said how about that nanoland show you know that i developed with jason and and jack lens and we kind of like yeah and we did 30 i think we did two sets of 35 or something like that and we did so many we would do 15 in a day it was <laughs> wow. we would literally improvise that show with cards that said 15 seconds 10 <laughs> seconds five seconds we'd usually like it'd be the whole thing we well, you'd usually use the first performance like I, part of what i think is magic about that show is that it was all about um improvisational spirit like mm-hmm. the the scripts were literally like a uh, dragonfly shows up <laughs> so then we would just kind of like I can work myself up to feel like a one and a half year old and just kind of like jump in. Oh wow, dragonfly. And we'd see what happened and then usually an ending would happen maybe on the third take. Mm-hmm. So we'd cut to a close up and then we'd use the rest for the for some sort of ending. Yeah. 
That is amazing because I wanted to um, talk about it too. Is uh, the kind of puppet show within a puppet show? Um, yeah. I guess this is, I don't know if you were doing this in the shorts or if this was something that was added later. That was the half hours, yeah. Uh, but the the Mister Wuka, yeah, Mister um, Wuka, yeah, and those were you kept that improvisation, yeah. uh, spirit, including the music and everything, right? Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's nice. You got a good eye. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. I was all about the improvisation, but when it became a half hour and we had educational consultants and that kind of thing involved, they were like. You can't just improvise a half hour <laughs> show and have no plot. Yeah. It's like, come on. That's what the kids are like. So <laughs> then they we've settled on having themes, which I even feel like was just too didactic and <laughs> over the top, you know, for my wild spirit. But I said, How about the Mr. Wookas though? Those can be improvised, right? And I would just have a sentence and the same thing, I would improvise it about five times with a whole bunch of people mm-hmm. in a tiny it was such a tiny little like like four by three set we'd all be you know kind of puppeteering in there but that's some of my favorite stuff i've ever done yeah yeah well and in the puppets during that um it looked like you could um from the little clips and images i've seen you could explore different puppetry styles within that too because yeah. it was a puppet show yeah exactly yeah. and that must have been a lot of fun to, to yeah totally doing. it was crude yeah. and you know so i made those crocheted puppets i had a girlfriend who crocheted some puppets and yeah carved a bunch out of balsa wood yeah, I was just, and I loved that they could be more rudimentary and absurd. So that was, I had so much creative fun. There's about 20 of those. And one day I'm going to pull them out of the vault because a lot of this Nanoland's from pre TiVo. Like it's like, right. nobody has it, it's nowhere. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how to get it released uh, somehow. Yeah. And the best way to do it. Well, and, and, um, you you were creator of the show and you puppeteered on the show and you were coming up with the themes and the concepts for it. Do you like wearing many different hats in a production? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it, it, puppet master comes with a personality. I think you know, you, I'm not a control freak because I really like to let whoever's involved be you know be able to be free too. Mm-hmm. But I like to be in charge so I can create that freedom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh. I mean, it's a lot um, to to do, like, but it's the one art that you can be a director and a performer at the same time, even better than because you were watching yourself under the set, right? So, where an actor who's in his fo- own films has to go back and get them to rewind and play it again, you've seen it, you watched it live, yeah, and you can set it up there because you're staring at the monitor and you can set up your own thing. So, it's kind of a a great combination, director puppeteer, yeah. Well, um, do I have the timeline right that you were still making Nanoland when Mr. Meaty started? We had just finished. You had just finished. Yeah, okay. we had just finished the half hours. And, uh, uh, there, yeah, Peter Gal, he was at Nickelodeon, and he was up at the Animation Festival in Ottawa. And I think one morning he saw Nanoland. He's like, what's these guys? And then he, we had make, made a bunch of shorts of, of um, Mr. Meaty. Oh really? With CBC, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those were uh, pretty funny. They they were you know they they were, those are pretty good those original shorts like Black Tar and all these sort of so he saw those and then it was fast. He just kind of got us rolling on Nickelodeon. Hardly tested it. Just went. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, the puppets for Mr. Meaty are so unique looking and different from say like traditional Muppet um, things and and I think. Um, and I was actually talking to Russ Walco about this today, too, is that all your puppets are very unique looking and, and really uh, great because they're so different from what we normally see on TV. But can you talk a bit about the Mr. Meaty puppets, uh, what they were made out of and why you went with that style? Sure. Well, um, we, you know, it, we were definitely all about doing things different than they had ever done before. Mm-hmm. I find that every time I do something, it's, I've never done it before. I was talking with Russ about that, actually. <laughs> we were like, yeah, I'm always like, do I know how to make puppets? I forgot that I may not know how to make puppets. But then you are creating each time, and you're making new decisions rather than making decisions from typical stuff. But the uh, the original way we did it was we did it kind of like Mr. Potato Head style. We like made a bunch of faces, and then uh, we made a bunch of eyes and a bunch of noses. We made nose plates. So you'd get like eight noses. So then you're kind of like... It's kind of choosing your character as you go along. Like, oh, this nose looks funny here, and this eye goes here, and and then that kind of developed it. It developed the characters in a more discovery kind of way. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's hot foam. It's like um, it's like uh, hot foam is actually kind of going out of style since silicone is so so great. But hot foam's light. 
Yeah. Hot foam latex. Yeah, it's in an oven. You mix the chemicals and, you know, it's what everything was made out of back in the day. The thing and Worf's forehead. <laughs> right. But uh, nowadays they use different materials. But, yeah, it's great for puppets. Super flexible. I mean, it's all about creating the maximum expression, I find. That's what I'm how I take puppets. Yeah. Well, and you made um, over 250 puppets for Mr. Meaty. Yeah. Um, And you were also a writer on the show. So were there times where you were writing something like, I want to see this puppet be built? You know what I mean? Like you're writing uh, something in there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. I got to make everything I wanted to do. Like I was like, I wanted to make something with Yetis. I always (laughs) wanted to. And I got to make a Yeti thing. You know, so yeah, it was a great opportunity to kind of make what a dream. Like, you know, we had. 50 people working for us yeah. you know with a nickelodeon budget suddenly and uh yeah just like okay it was that was too many hats though a little bit really like yeah well i don't know i like to make things as good as they can be and you can't perfect television quite as much as you like when you have to look at the edit and you have to read the scripts and there's a new script coming along down the pipeline and and yeah now that i look at it i'm like oh those are things i wish i could have i i kind of remember thinking that i didn't love that and i wish i could have had the time to fix it yeah but you know you're moving quick with television right you're pumping it out right well i was looking through your youtube channel uh, as i said and i noticed that every time you post a mr meaty clip uh, inevitably, someone says, when is there going to be more Mr. Meaty? I know. Is... And uh, your answer is that, you know, they're, it's owned by Viacom or whoever yeah. owns it. Um, but is Mr. Meaty something you would like to revisit, like if that was worked out? Yeah, of course. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, that somebody said if I go, um, I'm going to try to get to Dragon Con this year. I'm going to try to go to the cons because I want to find the fans. I know they're out there. Yeah. I wanted to bring them to my YouTube and my Instagram at jshananana. <laughs> I want to find them. And apparently the, that that might get the attention of the network. Sometimes it brings things back. Right. Because they're not aware of the fan base is it's it's hidden until they know. Yeah. You know, especially on the Internet. It's a different world. They don't know what. Has become a Tumblr sensation. Right, exactly. Yeah, in, at Nickelodeon or Disney or whatever. Right. But I'd have to, you know, I haven't seen, well, <laughs> no. I haven't seen my partner for about 10 years. We've been working on different things, so. Oh, okay. So that, that would have to be worked out. Yeah, that would have to yeah. be worked out, too. Um, well, it, and maybe you've already answered this with um, talking about wearing too many hats, but if it came back, would you take like a... Like, let a couple of those jobs go to somebody else so you could work more on the creative side? Or Well, we did have, um, we had some great writers that helped. These guys, and they actually are, I think they were writing some Simon, I'm forgetting their names. But anyway, they wrote, they did the uh, Dark Crystal. I think they were part of writing the new Dark Crystal. Okay. So, great writers. And mm. yeah, I would definitely bring them back. I think I think they wrote some great st- scripts for Mr. Reedy. There was some phenomenal. So, you know, I'd definitely work with them again. I have not not really any complaints about Mr. Meaty. Mm -hmm. Some of the humor's a bit dated. Like, you know, it's it was it was. I think the you know it's funny how ten years passes and you're just like you can't make those jokes anymore. Right, right, yeah. You know, a break dance episode. You know, and I'm just like (laughs) kind of makes me go. "Uh," You know, we're just kind of riding funny lines there. So, you know, we would kind of take it on a bit differently. But uh, yeah, that'd be fun. Was that was Mr. Meaty? it seems like it was, but more scripted than Nana Land was. Like, oh yeah, or was there Mr. improv as well? Not much improv. No. Oh no, really? Not much improv. Yeah, yeah, and I'm fine with that too. Mm-hmm. Like, if you write well and you act well and you own your part, then it's great, you know. And writing can create some amazing things. Yeah, yeah, that are different from him. Im- improv has its own quality. Right. Improv has a, a, a energy to it, like because you don't know where things are going, and the audience can feel that too. And I think there's a lot of humor. It's like when you watch improv on stage, it's that fall off the cliff feeling that's behind it, I think, that gives it humor. Right. The terror. The terror. Gives yeah. It the humor. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of terror in the performer and terror in the audience. Like, yeah. oh, God. This could be really bad. Yeah. <laughs> Both are saying that. The yes. actor and the, the audience. Yeah. Um, well, I'd love to move on and talk about uh, the series Big and Small. Yeah. Because it's a fantastic series, and you were. Uh, the creative producer and the director and puppeteer on the series. And how did that project come your way? Um, that was, we were just coming off of Mr. Meaty and uh, probably, you know, 
people were hot to work with us. And I think they tried a few different... It was a, an English company. And they tried stop motion. And they tried animation. And they tried puppets. So we, ma- we made a big and a small. And did a little test. And mm-hmm. they liked it. So... So off we went. And then I ended up using that big that we made for the Yeti in, in Mr. Me. Oh, really? Yeah. It was, that's what's underneath there. That's how I was able to get a Yeti in, you know, a week. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then uh, they really loved what we did. And our skills were quite honed by that point. You know, we had done Nanolan and Mr. Meaty and millions of other side projects. So... You know, I think the puppetry is pretty amazing on that show. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. And I wanted to ask because, I mean, in the name, it's big and small. You have a big character, a small character. What were the challenges of some of the shots and stuff of getting those two characters together? Well, big isn't that big. He is actually just a hand puppet. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a big one. I was supposed to play big, but I decided not to because I'm not a big guy. And I was just like, I'm going to die with that thing. <laughs> so I played the uh, the mouse and the worm and I directed yeah. And uh so uh yeah it was it was fine it was really fun we had such a great crew and we made these wonderful landscapes like all the wide shots with the nature and everything you know um this guy Brad Archdeacon he really headed up a great team there of of set makers and you know it was that was a fun show to make we did a lot you know some great green screens and the music videos yeah and the writing was really good too it, you know i think the english they just you know They've got it for they they invented the English language and they <laughs> and Shakespeare is in their blood. And yeah. I, I feel like yeah, big and small. I was like, oh, it makes it really easy to direct when it's a great story. Yeah, well, and that first um, the first episode is just like it's just great. like it hooks you right away. Like it's just it's really great. And uh, I'll put links to that in the show notes as well, so people can check it out. Oh, but... do you know? Do you have a link with the English voices? I think I, I think I, I, mean, the, I remember the Canadian seeing, voices. I think I remember seeing it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I'd like to know that too because I'm like, oh, where can I find this? Somebody was asking about it, and I because they revoiced it uh, for the English for the Great Britain audience. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's this guy Larry Lenny Henry or something like that. Maybe maybe the one I saw, I just didn't realize it. W- I just remember seeing the first episode where Small comes to live with Big, right? And yeah, that's the, that's the first episode, and it was just. I think somebody posted on Facebook, and it was so great. So I'll I'll find that link and send it to you. I don't know if it's the correct Thanks. one or not. Thanks. Um, not to get into any details or anything like this, but as someone who's worked closely with a partner as you did with Jason, um, what advice do you have about maintaining like a good creative working sh- hmm. partnership with? Somebody? Yeah, that's such a tricky thing, huh? You know, we were so good together because we were very different personalities in a way. Like, um, I'm kind of like more left field and he had a real sort of like commercial sensibility that that together it kind of really worked well with us. And, uh, you know, I I think everything, I, I, you know, I don't think we did much wrong. You have to just, I don't know, kindness is the trick for everything in this world. Kindness and compassion and even if you you get hot tempered and you're so angry, don't say that awful thing that the other person will never forget. Yeah, you know, I think that's the most important thing. You know, I you just, you know, the anger will fade, and then then you didn't say something that they're gonna have to pull the arrow out of their soul for the next three years as they think of how mean that was. Yeah, I, I think it's the same thing with marriage. It's like a marriage. <laughs> it is like a marriage. It is a marriage. And we one thing that was so great about our partnership is. Uh, Jason's so talented too, and we both did everything, so neither of us could kind of like have any real estate that was like, I'm the writer, I'm the puppet maker, I'm the designer, I'm the puppeteer. We right. both did everything and were quite competitive with each other with everything. So I think that lifted our bar higher and higher because we were we would trade episodes. I direct an episode and he direct an episode and he direct. So then, you know, that created this natural sense of competition that I think really made our shows so good. Yeah. And our skills rise. Yeah. Well, and you just mentioned directing was um, making the move into directing. Is that something you had always wanted to do? Uh, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's still, I'm still, you know, I've got some great projects. LA has been very inspiring to me, but 
yeah, I I want you know like I'm I'm like to move towards making films. That's my plan now. Mm-hmm. Cre- creature films like my original love. Right. And now the that kind of creature film is back. Right. Like I've been visiting all the puppet shops and everybody's making creatures again. And uh, you know uh, even kids are like uh, it's all CG. You know, and everyone knows that when that is uh, just something created digitally, right. and they really appreciate when something's real. So. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, directing was great. We just, you know, we kind of started, I think, with the Nanolan half hours. Well, the three-minute shorts we kind of directed, too. But those were just really just the camera just ran. <laughs> right. Placed the camera here, and we <laughs> ran it for three minutes. But uh, then we did Nanolan. And then Mr. Meaty, we really cut our teeth with sort of like, you know, Nanolan was a uh, three-camera. We did, it, we did it like a sports event. Or maybe it was a wide and a close. Was it two? Anyway, yeah, we shot it twi- with two cameras the whole time uh, to be a, to be more kind of like what the original Nanoland was, that kind of witnessing an experience. Yeah. But then Mr. Meaty was true directing. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, shots and I love editing and I love music and I love the way it, you can push put something together and how the ma- meaning changes by how long shots are and the color and the music. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And I think that uh, as being a puppeteer yourself, um, you know better how to direct puppet stuff yeah. than somebody who just comes in and has no idea. Yeah. You're like, well, yeah, there has to be a person there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there has to be a person underneath. <laughs> I know people are always like, well, what are you going to put the what are you going to put in front of the puppet? Like the couch or, <laughs> you know, they always picture that thing that you need on stage, which is like something to hide the puppeteer. Yeah. But then, of course, you have the bottom of frame. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I uh, speaking of film, I saw your film Rasputin as yeah, part right. of uh, right. Heather Henson's Handmade yeah. Puppet Dreams. Uh, where did the idea for that film come about? Um, I uh, I don't know. I was kind of fascinated. We had this guy named Rob Ford who was our mayor for a while. <laughs> yes. And then um, he kind of got me fascinated with these kind of like characters that people can't stop talking about. They hate them. They love them. Um, I don't know if you know anyone else like that. They just love and hate <laughs> Possibly. it. Yeah, they're just sort of these enigmatic characters that really capture the imagination of people on all sides. Yeah. So Rasputin was like that. He was just, even back in the day, I read this, I read so many books about him, but there's this story about him, a sign on the wall that says, no talking about Rasputin. <laughs> Which I'm sure there's no talking about people on signs nowadays because <laughs> right. people are just so tired of the subject. But it's just sort of like they just wrap people's imagination. So I just find him a real fascinating character. Yeah. Well, what would you say was the most challenging thing about making that short? Uh, you know, I've never done such for schnickety puppets. Like my puppets are usually kind of furry and soft and you just put them on your hand and they're fine. Mm. But that had lots of little mechanics and stuff like that. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's yeah, really yeah, yeah. That, that was like, uh, that was tricky to make all those mechanics work. Um, my friend Marcus Jaman was really helpful. He got this, there's this $400 German puppet book. I think it's from, you know, it's like a 60 or 70 years old, but it's filled with these amazing mechanics. Um, it's a hard book to get your hands on, but it's pretty neat. So I used a lot of those. And created kind of a new kind of puppet. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's such a unique look. Like, uh, people should definitely check it out. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, it's interesting. I wrote a feature for it. Mm-hmm. But I kind of... I don't know that watching a whole feature of hard-faced puppets is... It, is it, it's too niche, I think. Like, that is short and funny yeah. and tight. But uh, I, I, I think I'm not going to make the feature. <laughs> Well, um, as I mentioned, I saw it with as part of Handmade Puppet Dreams. Oh, yeah, nice. How did they get involved with the short? Uh, I met Heather at uh, uh, Puppets on Film in a festival in New York City. And then we just became friends and hanging out. And she is an amazing supporter of the grassroots of all puppets. Like She supports Puppet Slams, mm-hmm. which is like the best thing to get puppeteers started. And she lets... You, or young filmmakers make their films with great creative freedom. So, uh, so that was a, you know, a a grant that she gave me and it cost double. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But, uh, you know, I gave my heart to it and I worked on it for years and I was like, it did take years because it was between all the other things in my life. And I shot a little bit here and a little bit there, but, uh, you know, in the end it won five awards. So it did really well. Yeah. So, 
And um, did you, were you involved in building all the sets and stuff too? Because the sets for it are, you know, all the shots are amazing as hey, well. Hey, thanks. Yeah, uh, you know, lots of people helped. Yeah. I had a t- huge team of people that helped with that. And then um, and then I gave it, the, I, sometimes I filled in the blanks with etched etchings. Like I wanted to have it look like a kind of histor- history book. Right. So this clouds and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of intricate building and that kind of thing. It was fun. I mean, that's why I did it as a puppet show. It's like. You know, they were, you know, the richest royalty in the world, I'm sure, of the the czar and the great, you know, you know, Russia was huge then. And, you know, all the taxes went to this one. So I like the idea that you could create this opulence, you know, uh, in puppet form and you just get stuff from the dollar store. Yeah, yeah. Well, recently you did a commercial campaign for Bright Health and on your website, uh, you mentioned that not only did the company want puppets that whistled, they wanted them in two weeks. Um, how do you handle that kind of pressure? Yeah, that was wild. <laughs> I'm good with pressure. I don't know what that is. I'm also good with working very fast. I can make stuff like crazy fast. Yeah, it was a risk. I had an actual friend who was <laughs> mad at me. He was like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're bound to fail. <laughs> it wasn't quite two weeks, it, but it was two weeks by the time we really got started um, with making because they weren't even designed. So from day one, it was about 25 days, but we had, I had to send them sketches. We were starting with sketches. Right. And then I started right away and I was like, who can make a whistling mechanism? And, you know, this guy in Ottawa, I got to friend and my friend Marcus and uh, even a dental assistant had an idea of how to make one. So I took all those ideas and I had two working mechanisms in the end. Wow. Two types. Two types, yeah. And one guy was so busy and I had to find everybody too because everybody was already busy. So... I I bought the design off him and got a a student to <laughs> rebuild the whistling mechanism in a few of the other puppets. Yeah, but it was fun, a slam and success. The all the commercials were great, and uh, we all had a ton of fun. Uh, I I just it makes me calm. Super pressure makes me really calm. I don't know why that is. I mean, I'm not that calm, but I just kind of go mm, and then just sort of like. You know, get through it because you're also working with ad agencies, and you know they have lots of notes. And right. you know, I my puppet shops on tr- on an island, so they would the ad agency would all load into a boat and come over <laughs> to my island puppet shop. It was really funny. I've had some funny adventures because I I had a boat and my puppet shops on an island, so I would. You know, I've delivered puppets. I delivered a piano <laughs> puppet by boat to Chorus Entertainment, <laughs> and. Uh, but that's a pretty calm place to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would imagine that's yeah. a lot of solitude. Type. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. a lot of. But I, I don't know. I love a challenge, and always commercials are huge challenges. They're just like they always give you. T- they work on the idea for two years, and then they're like, "Okay, you got ten days to make this <laughs> right. thing we've been deliberating over for years." Yeah. Well, I was on a tour last fall, and I saw some of the puppets from the campaign on, like, bus benches. And, oh, yeah? Yeah. Is that... Is that uh, did you send one to Russ? I did send one to Russ. Oh, yeah. that was you. Okay. He yeah. showed that to me. I was like, hey! <laughs> yeah. Is that weird, seeing your stuff? Or is that, like, cool? Like, no, it's the best. Stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey. Another friend, Ben, said he saw one in his dentist's office, or <laughs> in his doctor's office, and he sent me the picture of that, which is pretty charming. Yeah. Uh, well, Nanoland started as shorts that became a series, and Mr. Meaty did as well. And it seems that um, shorts are kind of a good proving ground for a bigger concept. Yeah, absolutely. I think if anybody wants to make something, you should just make it first. Yeah. I think it's very hard. E- you know, I've had these great successes, but I have a lot of trouble. I just got back from kid screen, and, you know, maybe they're going to take my ideas, maybe not. But I I find it quite challenging to describe an idea to someone and for them to – because they just hear ideas all day. Right. And it just – I think it just kind of starts to start – they just can't they can't hear it anymore. I couldn't hear it. I can't imagine hearing people's ideas that much. But now we all have the ability. We all have a telephone. We all have YouTube. So you can make your thing. Yeah. And then, yeah, then then it's absolutely, there it is. And I think if the, uh, I'm a big believer in do it yourself, like don't wait for anybody. Yeah. And also kind of like use what you have. And it's like, yeah, you could, you know, save up money for years to buy a 4K camera and then 4K cameras aren't even the thing anymore. You know, but it's like, use your phone, use YouTube. And if the concept's good enough, it can be worked upon later. Right? Yeah. It will yeah. always evolve into something. Yeah. I know. I think there's a lot of people stuck in, uh, stuck in writing. 
Yeah. Well, unless you're a writer, then you're make that is your what you're making. But a lot of people who want to make things are stuck in the development and the drawing and the prep and the but the doing always leads to more doing. Right. With all, you know. And I always think at the at the end of the day, um someone will be more impressed uh like you know, you could spend 2 years working on one thing. But you could also spend two years making a hundred things. And in my opinion, someone would be more impressed by, wow, you made all these things? That's great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you made a hundred episodes of this yeah. show on your own? That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And things are, yeah, some things you make might not be good, but they can be remembered as fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> like, I did this, I ran a duck for mayor, and... uh in the end, I don't think the skits were that funny in the end, as I, you know, just, I was too busy with other things. But I ran a duck for mayor, and that's all they need to remember. I don't know. Right, <laughs> yeah. As a director, uh, what advice could you give to somebody out there who's making their own stuff to uh, just up their quality a little bit? Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, um, I don't know. You, you, shooting things on um, with diagonal... Um, lines is nice like i think if you shoot something flat it's not so nice um i don't know uh choose using daylight is a nice touch yeah um well with a puppet you have so much control of your frame too so make sure you use the whole thing you can come right up to your camera and you can go way far away near far (laughs) um i don't know what else it's like uh i think it's a little bit of um you know, it's just playing and doing things. And if you have somebody who's got a skill that's greater than yours at camera or joke writing or music, let them into your world. I think collaborating, I think collaborating elaborates. So, you know, I think just being open to other people's ideas and, and skills can make your thing better. Yeah. If they've got those skills. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's, that's good advice. And as someone who has pitched, and I'm sure you, you just mentioned you're still pitching ideas and shows, what advice do you have for creators about going into a pitch meeting? Um, I just actually had some, there was a kid screen, the person I was pitching with, she was teaching a pitching seminar. So she, we worked on her projects, our project and really worked on it well. <laughs> right. So uh, preparation, be prepared, know a lot about your project, imagine the questions they might ask. And we rehearsed it about six or seven times, um, the words and everything, like wrote it out. I tell apart, she tell apart, they tell apart. And it impresses people because they are trusting you to to create something. That, it, creating things takes a lot of type A personality. You need to be on top of deadlines and, and you have your stuff come together. Um, you know, making a television show or a movie or any of these things is a huge project. So pre- being prepared and professional, I think, is great. And um, I also think it's ne- not necessarily going to happen for you if you go to the market and pitch there. I think it happens other places. Yeah. I think you go to the market and meet people and they want to work with you. And then it happens when you accidentally run into them sitting beside uh, them on a plane one day or something. Right. You know, it really is a, it's a random situation. But... Getting out there and getting in front of lots of people and meeting lots of people and being a low-maintenance human being to work with. Because anything you make in television or movies, you're going to spend hours and hours and hours with these people. Not that... I, I hear lots of... And so many creators are tyrants anyway, so <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> well, that works for you. It works for me. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Well, exactly. and I think networking is a great thing because I know... Um, not all puppeteers, but a lot of puppeteers, and I would even say myself included, is like I'm not the best. I could be in a room full of people, and I'm like, yeah, I don't really need to go over and say hi to people. But networking is what you should do. You should go talk to everybody. Yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's not just going to magically uh, come <laughs> right. to you for what you're doing. Yeah, there's a lot to do though. The good thing is, I feel like puppets are. We're just scratching the surface. I really feel like there's so much to be done. Yeah. Well, hopefully, let's do it. Yeah, let's I'm do in. it all. I'm, I'm, in. I'm <laughs> yeah. ready. Yeah, let's do it. Well, um, and you mentioned uh, your Instagram account before, and I love how open you are with sharing your art and your process on social media. Do you think that's a benefit for artists to do that? I'm trying to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been doing it. I kind of, I really decided to get more busy with social media uh, only three months ago. So 
I'm trying to find out what is valuable and what people react to. So it's actually the end of the three months, so I'm reviewing it myself. Right oh, now. really? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, people like things that are funny and heartfelt or shocking. Or, um, you know, sometimes if it... Sh- so I'm going to... I'm You know, there's so many places to put everything. So, you know, the good thing is there's lots of analytics and you can see how many right. you know people directly respond to things. So... I'm like, oh, well, people really like when I put the Mr. Meaty videos and the Mis- and the Nanoland videos out. But, um, you know, maybe I'm going to leave my Facebook friends alone because those are all just my friends and family. <laughs> right. And try to get uh, steer it towards more public situations. Like if I put a page on Facebook, now I realize that's a more kind of like public thing. So that they they've decided to see all this stuff. So maybe I'll keep on putting the Nanoland behind the scenes just on the Nanoland page rather than out to all my friends that, you know, are like, okay, Jamie, how many <laughs> things are you going to make us like a day? Yeah. Um, I don't want to do spam, every, but I, it's so valuable, So uh, the, all that nowadays, like your count and you know, all your, that kind of stuff. So I'm looking into starting YouTube in the, in the spring. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of gearing up to that. So do I'm you- learning. Do you like exploring these different avenues? Do you like like go and see what happens on YouTube and Instagram? Yeah, and yeah. yeah, I do. Yeah, really though, I think if uh, I think I would do better if I was more focused. If I had a, a you know a fault, it would be I like to try to do too many things. Mm-hmm. So I need to cut things off and and do one thing. That's what I like when I get a gig. Like that's maybe why I get so calm when I have a commercial. It's like. I can't do anything else. <laughs> I can't do anything for three weeks. Yeah. Nothing. So, you know, if a show came along or, or something actually happened, and then I can put 100% of myself into one thing. Right. There's value in that. Yeah. Well, as uh, we wrap up here, I just have a couple more questions. But how would you say your puppetry has evolved over the years? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know that it has that much, actually. I feel like I am still that same human. Uh, I just kind of, uh, I feel like I have a very present style of puppeteering. Like, it kind of, it feels very real to me. I, I, even when I look at my puppets, I'm like, oh. You know, I just kind of, like, I can project myself into a puppet quite nicely. But what what has changed with my puppeteering? I don't know. I, I, I'm excited. There's a lot of puppets I'm excited to make. Mm-hmm. Like, I keep on thinking of new ways to make puppets, and I can't, uh, I don't always get the opportunity to make them. So I, I'm excited to try my new styles that I keep on finding. There's so many new materials. That's exciting. Like, silicone rubber is so neat. The colors are so beautiful. And, um, yeah, there's just and new plastics and warbla. I don't know if you know warbla. No, I haven't heard of that. Warbla is cool, and there's this, um, there's this other, um, these... Warbler is like a lot of cosplayers use it to make armor and stuff. It's, okay. It's almost like you heat it with a heat gun and then it's like a fruit roll up that you can kind of like sk- stick to itself and sculpt into shapes and then it dries hard again. It's lovely. Yeah. And then there's this hydro thermoplastic, these little beads. You dip them in hot water and then you take them out and again you can just kind of shape it and you can make it into machinable plastic. So it's great for like teeth and eyes and, and mechanics inside of puppets. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so much to experiment with now. That's, yeah. that's fun. Like, yeah. like back in the day, there wasn't so many materials. It's funny. I was, I went to the Bob Baker theater, which is mm-hmm. in Los Angeles and saw some of his puppets from the fifties. And he literally was not working with any materials. I was like, <laughs> and that's a towel. And that's, you know, he, <laughs> right. you know, there's just wasn't anything out in 1950 to make puppets out of. So, yeah. um, you know, you can always find interesting materials to, to build with yeah what has been the highlight of your career so far hmm hmm mr wuka was i'm very proud of that i i just had so much fun i loved doing them mm-hmm. i loved that i uh making a show for nickelodeon was a super highlight of course like yeah we were just you know that was just you know such such a healthy budget to work with that it was nothing like the towels we had worked with before <laughs> so that was a super highlight um i'm just trying to think of very touching moments there was there was one time it was really cute i was doing this live performance and this little kid came up to my puppet and he was just 
telling me all the stuff he needed to tell. And they forget what he was talking about. It was just like, you know, a little bit of troubles he's having and good things. And it was amazing how much he expressed to this puppet. And uh, that was just such a, a neat experience and a really kind of like uh, quite touching to how uh, these characters are. Uh, they're so accessible, I guess, for people. Yeah. That they would feel more comfortable talking to a puppet than a, <laughs> right. than a, than a therapist. Right. Or something like that. That's what I need in that room full of people. I need them all to have puppets, then I can go talk to the puppets. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, Jamie, if people want to connect with you online, where can they go? Oh, well, um, I'd love everybody to join my Instagram at jshananana. It's J-S-H-A-N-A-N-A-N-A. All right. And then my YouTube, is, I think, is just Jamie Shannon. Oh, is it Big Guppy? He's well, Big Guppy. I will find a link to it, yeah. and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Um, but, Jamie, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us here on Under the Public. Hey, thanks. Oh, I'm on Twitter, too. Oh, on Twitter, Shenanigan. too. Shenanigan. Jay Shenanigan. All the links will be in the show notes. Woo! Thanks, Jamie. Thanks. My thanks to Jamie Shannon for being on this episode. For links to Jamie's website and more of his work, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 29, over at underthepuppet.com. And that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I welcome your feedback via email at hello at saturdaymorningmedia.com or via Twitter, where the show is at username Under the Puppet. You can also find us on Facebook by searching for Under the Puppet. I want to hear your suggestions for questions I should be asking and for future guests. Let me know who I should be talking to. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time right here on Under the Puppet. This episode of Under the Puppet featured music by Dan Ring and was edited by Stephen Staver. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind-the-scenes information, and exclusive bonus content. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2019 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.